Her name is Sarah, and she is my mother. When she was about seven or eight, she told us that if any of her children were gay, she would disown us. It twirled in my mind and it sat there. At the time, I hadn't even gone through puberty yet. I'm not even sure I was conscious of what I was, but it sat there, heavy and fat. A hate-filled statement that seemed out of character. My mom is not a Bible thumper. She isn't a conservative. She's an East Coast Jew who usually votes Democrat. But in her mind, it was this idea of the other. There were the Jews she surrounded herself with, and then there were non-Jews who had different values. Homosexuals were even further away, a different species we had no knowledge of outside of shows like Three's Company that turned it into a prancing minstrel show. <laughs> whatever lewd things homosexuals did, whatever god they worshipped, nothing like that was going to happen in our family. Her name was Jen. She was one of my best friends in high school, and she came out as a lesbian when I was 16. I would test my mother by telling her about Jen. Jen has a new girlfriend. Jen is taking her to prom. My mom would shake her head and respond, her poor mother. His name was Josh. He was my other best friend. He loved musical theater. In high school, his parents sat him down and told him that if he was gay, it would be okay with them. They loved him anyway. I was jealous of his wonderful parents. And by the way, Josh wasn't even gay. <laughs> his name was Nathan. He was the first real homosexual I'd ever talked to. I was 19 and in college. I met him in an international perspective on gay and lesbian history class. Part of me was curious over what it really meant. A bigger part of me simply wanted to get laid. <laughs> this was a time that predated Grindr, and I had no idea how else to meet guys. I sat through lectures on whether Emily Dickinson's letters actually revealed a longing for her secret female lover. I watched Paris is Burning and saw snap queens express their outrage in a series of Z-Sage snaps. <laughs> and I had no interest in any of it. I looked around the room and surveyed my classmates. Nathan and I were the only two gay men in the class, besides the guy who wore a skirt every day and had pink hair. The rest were lesbians and bi guys who claimed to have girlfriends. Nathan and I had nothing in common. He seemed like a character to me. He was wicked. He had long, spindly hands that crept and moved when he spoke, like two menacing spiders. I thought he smelled vaguely of old semen. <laughs> Nathan would go on and on about how oppressive and homophobic the University of Maryland was. How the previous day when he and his boyfriend had thrust their hands down each other's pants in the dining hall, they were asked to stop. <laughs> and when they refused, told to leave. I did not like Nathan. But he was a fascinating window into a world I never thought I would touch. After all, he had hooked up with a real boy. And that part of him made him almost a hero to me. I had never done as much as hold a guy's hand. I wonder, would I have to become like him? To be gay? Would thrusting my hands down the pants of another boy in public seem ordinary and mundane? Would my mother stare on in horror as my father and my boyfriend during the Seder? <laughs> His name was Antoine. I met him at the Sexual Minority Youth League in DC. I had been there several weeks, honestly, just trying to meet someone. He had taken a liking to me and referred to me as a she. I had enough issues trying to awkwardly come out. I wasn't looking for anything that skirted gender, and I warned him that I was very happy being a boy, and if he harbored issues with his own gender identity, it would be best to leave me out of it. He reeked a baby powder and showed me his zippered thong, telling me that he would make me his queen. I wondered if this would be my future. Where does one even buy a zippered thong? And did he hide his laundry from his parents or proudly leave it on top of a pile of dirty socks? His name was AJ. When he showed up at the support group, we locked eyes across the room. The usual support group banter faded away. 
This one came home in a dress, and his mother threw a shoe at him. This one wrote a 15 stanza song about his one night stand that he shared with us in falsetto. <laughs> I only saw EJ, and we both knew through glances that we were going to divergenize each other. <laughs> that night, he came over to watch a movie. We awkwardly sat there and asked him if he wanted a drink. AJ had never had a drink, so I offered him a shot at my box of Alabama Slammers I kept in the fridge. I asked him if he wanted to smoke pot. AJ had never done that either, so we smoked a bowl. And then we got each other off. <laughs> AJ didn't feel right, but it was a start. Its name was Delta Lambda Phi. It was a gay frat in DC. Most of the members were a good 20 years out of college. I was a senior and not even 21. I had never had any interest in frats, but I joined looking for new brothers, gay brothers. I learned the Greek alphabet. I went through the motions. In the end, I wrote poems vowing I would never end up like them and quit after five weeks. I didn't want to see myself looking for a new family in 20 years inside a patchwork institution. I missed my own family. I missed feeling normal. I knew I was gay, but I didn't know how I fit into this new world. Everywhere I looked, I saw straight people, on TV, on campus, and my family. What I didn't see was myself. That's why I was pushing my old life away, looking for a new one. I couldn't tell anyone because they would never look at me the same. So I lied to my mom when she asked if I was dating anyone. I lied when the Gay Society of Maryland sent a rainbow tassel to my house after I told them not to. <laughs> I lied when the gay porn catalog was accidentally boarded home over spring break. I invented all kinds of lies. I wove elaborate tales, big and small, complex and simple. I looked my mother in the eyes and I lied freely, and I hated myself for it. But I didn't know how to stop, so I looked for validation in other ways. His name was Damien. He was number three on the list I kept on my wall, my trophy of conquest. We did what we did under the giant cross he had in his room. I was glad I was Jewish, but I also knew that one night was all I needed was someone with a giant crucifix in an otherwise barren room. I don't remember the rest of their names. Some I met in bathhouses, some in bars, some in parties. There was one guy I knew as Cockroach who wore a possum skull around his neck. There was another one I blew in the janitor's closet at the magnetic field show. <laughs> I kept the list to give what I was doing value. I stopped at 100 because I ran out of room in the paper and was ashamed. Putting this list on the wall made light of it. I could joke on it on the outside. Look at me, I'm a gay slut. <laughs> on the inside, I felt dirty. I never learned his name. I never talked to him. I was going to another bar by myself. I was one year out of school and in Philly for work. The bar was called shampoo or hairspray. He was standing outside under a streetlight, waiting for someone, I'm guessing someone to pay him. He was crying a little bit, and his tears reflected the light. I never went in. I knew that none of this was me, and I didn't want to become like him, and I was afraid I would. I wanted to find part of myself again, or I was worried that I would lose it forever. I started composing my coming out letter to my mom on my way home to the hotel. It burst out of me that night. I went straight to my room and I wrote for four hours in an insane, possessed way. I didn't need to edit or make a second draft. I wrote it all by hand. I refused to get up to pee when my arm went numb from leaning on it. I just needed to say it and finish. If I moved, I was worried I would lose it and I would never be able to start again. I needed her to understand because I believed it would stop me from becoming someone else. So that weekend, I read her my letter. My name is Leo, and I'm your son, and I love you but I'm tired of lying to you. I continued by Elaine when I thought would be her biggest fear. I was never going to become a Streisand impersonator. <laughs> I told her that I will never change. I might as well change my eye color or decide to be left-handed. I will never, ever, ever be with a woman. I will give you grandkids and most likely they'll be brown or yellow or black, but you will love them because they will be your family. I went on and on, and finally I finished and waited. She looked at me, tears in her eyes, and with her voice quivering a little bit, she said, Leo, you still need to date Jews. <laughs>